Hello beautiful, you are listening to episode 72 of the Africana Woman podcast. Chulu is my name, I am a writer, self-branding coach, entrepreneur and mentor. This show is the home of African women's stories. We share ideas, triumphs, challenges, and lessons from our perspective as women. Our library is a step to cementing our place in history. Her story, your story, is powerful. Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to all the new listeners and welcome back to the Africana Woman family. Please hit the subscribe button or visit AfricanaWoman.com to become an official Africana Woman visionary. Hold up, hold up. <laughs> so this week, the Africana Woman with Chulu podcast was featured in The Guardian. That same Guardian, you know. <laughs> it was amongst 12 podcasts mentioned as best African podcasts with the endorsement of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Friend, friend. I had no clue this was happening. In fact, my Italian friend who lives in the UK was the first to tell me about it. And I thought he was crazy, you know? So he sent me the link. I clicked through and boom, my whole name spelled correctly in the Guardian. Yo, guys. Hey, at this stage, I have to give a huge shout out to Adele Onyango, the superb creator and host of Legally Clueless podcast, who is out in Kenya doing big things in the world. She inspires me every day. So she nominated this podcast to be on that list. Now, to all the broken radios who like to say women don't support each other. Yeah. Here, here. This is exhibit A to Z <laughs> of a woman reaching back to carry other women as she breaks glass ceilings. You will never, 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 guys, convince me that women don't support each other. They are there and they are a lot. Adele, thank you so much, my darling. Guys, eh, my goodness, to be acknowledged and seen. <sighs> okay, let me put it this way. You know, when I started the podcast, the people around me didn't understand what I was called to do. When I quit my job, they then concluded, yes, she's mad. <laughs> she's lost it. Oh, but I can't blame them, hey. Uh <laughs> So what I have come to realize that uh, my gift is creating safe spaces for African women to share their true selves. Over and over, when I am interviewing these women, I have seen, I've seen them heal as they have been able to take what they have been carrying on the inside and, you know, for the most part, they've been carrying it alone because they've never told anyone about it, you know, and they've been carrying it for so many years. And then when they come on the podcast, they're able to verbalize it in a way that is so empowering. It is a sacred act of claiming your I am. For this work and the podcast to be acknowledged on a global stage, such as The Guardian, was it was really special. It was like our mission had been, you know, rolling down the runway. And when it, you know, this was published, it was like at that moment it took flight. And then people can actually see, they actually saw like what we were actually about, what our mission and our vision was about and understood it. <sighs> There's still so many stories to be told and many lives to be touched. And the only way to go is up. Thank you guys so, so much. So, so much for supporting this podcast. I appreciate you so much. Okay. On this week's episode, essentially, it is a story about immigration, education, and the truth. <laughs> you know how they say there is your truth, their truth, and the actual truth. Hmm. Anyway, 
as I was editing this episode, I got so emotional because of the depth, the vulnerability and level of self-awareness that our guest was able to share. I am incredibly proud of the woman she has become. The conversation is actually split into two parts. And if you think the first part is interesting, wait for the second part. Wait for it. You. <laughs> so our guest this week is my beautiful sister, Penelope Kapere from Namibia, who immigrated to the UK. Please, please, please give a warm welcome to Penelope, to the Africana woman, Mike. Penelope Kapere is a Namibian young lady based in London. She works as an educational programs manager for a global nonprofit. In her spare time, Penelope enjoys spending time with friends, trying new adventures and reading. She believes her life is a miracle. Now, isn't that amazing? I am so excited to welcome her to the Africana woman, Mike. Penelope, hi. <laughs> hi, girl. I am so honored to be here. I've been waiting for this moment all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I love I'm so it. honored. And um, can I just I tell you, I know, you. that's what I was about to say. I was like, I wish the audience like will go see what she's wearing. She looks absolutely beautiful. So go check it out on YouTube. So okay. thank you, girl. I said I had to come here because my sis always dresses up and she did that. You, I did, you did a head wrap workshop, I think. So I said, you know, let me try me a nice piece. And then also try, I was looking for a brooch. Can you imagine for like a few days? Because I was like, no, I'm going on to the show. I need to come with the fashion because she doesn't play. So I was like, to honor the that people, people, I'm going to bring something you look gorgeous you look absolutely you stunning you look amazing. amazing i love the colors oh, thank you so mm -hmm. uh, let's start with what is your favorite childhood memory oh that's an interesting one um probably one that comes to mind is that every saturday my mom she worked crazy hours she was a waitress at an continental hotel called safari hotel in namibia still there and she used to work um really like at three in the morning and then come at maybe 1 p.m and then go back for at 10 p.m to four in the morning so they were unfunctional hours um but every saturday what she'll try and do is to ensure that she spends time with me and we usually just used to go shopping or she would take me swimming. So um, I always did extracurriculum activities on Saturdays, which were quite nice. I love that. Um, and I can so empathize with your mom because I used to work in a hotel. I was the hotel manager, you know, six days on one mm. day off and then that same one day off people are still calling me imagine right and this you want to rest and then you have a child as well so i yeah. know i so oh my goodness but that is so beautiful i love that you have those memories where are you right now i'm actually in the uk um i moved mm -hmm. to a small town called twyford it's a it's a little village everybody's confused as to why i'm here <laughs> um <laughs> There's only 7,000 people in this town. Yeah. For the UK, that's quite small. Uh, I come from Namibia. Mm -hmm. There's only 2 million people. So 7,000 does seem quite a bit. But it's a small little village. It's only elderly people. There's not a lot of young people. But I moved eight months ago from London. Uh, and the reason was I used to live in a townhouse that didn't have a garden. So when the, when the pandemic hit, we didn't have an outside space. And it was quite challenging to just be stuck in your room because here in the UK, people share, like when you're house sharing, that means you're just sharing the room. Like, you know, you have your own room in the house. So um, that was quite daunting for me. And just mentally, it wasn't healthy. Uh, I decided to come down here because I grew up around this area. Um, and then the house also has a garden and I have like, nice greenery. So yeah, yeah. I'm in London, Twyford. Or in the UK, uh, yeah, yeah. So I love the sentence. Make it make sense for us. So you're okay. in Namibia, and then then you grew up in the UK. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Namibia. I speak my native language. Um, I always fly the the flag high. Um, but at the age of fifteen, I came to the UK, and um, mm -hmm. the reason I came to the UK is my stepdad is British Caucasian and him and my mom came 
a few years ahead of me and they settled here. Um, so then they asked for me to come over and I left Namibia at the age of 15. That was over like 15 years ago as well. Yeah. Are you an only child? No, <laughs> but I'm the last one. <laughs> ah. I have an older sister, but there's a 10 year age gap. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of did feel like I was the only child because she felt like a second mom. Um, but she's based back in Namibia. So mm-hmm. I still have family back home. I still have a lot of like roots back home, basically. Yeah. So when your parents came ahead of you, who did you stay with? Girl, I was in and out of houses. <laughs> Like, you know, when they have to leave you with the one auntie this this one year, then the next is this other auntie. Like, that was me. I've moved so many times. I tell people I've probably moved over 100 times, like, my whole life. When my mom and my stepdad came over to the UK, I was left with an auntie. I lived with her for, I think, two years. Because um, my mom left when I was, like, nine or ten. So I lived with her for two years. Then I lived with my dad for a year and a bit. And then when I went into high school, I went into boarding school for a year and a half. Um, but whilst I was at high school, I got kicked out. So Why my happened, parents, girl? <laughs> my parents then decided, no, this girl needs to come to the UK. So coming to the UK was like a punishment, really. Oh, um, really? Yeah, it wasn't like this exciting thing that I was keen to do. It was more so that my mom was worried um, that I would just, you know, wound out streets. <laughs> so she requested for me to to come over to the UK, and that's how I came over mm-hmm. to the UK. That's interesting. But you have to tell us what happened. <laughs> Listen, the guy. I, I tell you, my life is a miracle. I think what happened was, you know, when you have when you move so much as a young girl, I think Mm. there's a level of feeling abundant, feeling like you're on this on your own. Um, Though I was fortunate enough to have family members who were okay-ish, it was still a struggle. I wasn't with my mom. Um, And my aunt only had boys as well, so I couldn't relate to them. And then when I lived with my dad, I was living with him and my stepmother, who was his girlfriend at the time. So, again, there was that separation. And when I went into boarding school, I guess I just started becoming slightly more rebellious. I mean, the thing that helped me is I was like an academic. I'm quite academic. So I got each other of boarding school, but not out of the school. And I went mm-hmm. to um, a boar school, you know, like this all-white schools. And you kind of start to see the difference in terms of wealth, like when you go to this wealthy school, it's like, it's when you're like a child who comes, cause I, my mom's house is still in the, in the hood, in the ghetto. Like that's where I was raised. And then to go to a school that's, you know, uppity, uppity, quite affluent and really good. You start to see how poor you are in a way, because when you're all in the hood, everybody that, you know, there's no, there's, there's no way to, to compare. Mm. Um, And I think for me, the struggle was the kids would have their parents come every week to bring them food or whatever. And my dad is coming every like once a month or something. So you now have to start hustling for like school, like food and stuff. So I think that pushed me to be a little bit more rebellious, like just not listening to my superintendents, the prefects and so forth. Mm. And as a result, I got kicked out. Yeah. 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 It's difficult. (laughs) Because, <laughs> yeah, I I know the the you know the types of schools you're talking about. My son also uh, went to one of those types of schools, and they're very um, family oriented. You know, Ooh. so I can see how um, it can be a challenge to see what your peers have and then not really feel it or have it in your own life you know so yeah yeah. but you know that's a long time that you stayed without your parents that's you said um that was about nine when they left and then you went there when you were 15 so and that's like a very important time for a girl you know in Mm -hmm. that period that 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 space of time, you know, puberty's hitting, um, you know, your first piece and all of that. And then, you know, you don't have your mom. I, yeah, I can just imagine. 
Girl, don't make me cry. It's too soon. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was difficult. I mean, I had my first period with my aunt, and even then, I was like, "Oh, something is happening. I don't know what's going on." And I was so embarrassed. And she gave, she gave me like the biggest pet I've ever seen in my life. Um, and she was just like, "Okay, yeah, this is what happens." But I was out with the boys when that happened, oh. and I thank God she was kind of there, um, mm. and she was quite supportive. But yeah, I think. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard. I, I struggled a lot. Um, it added to my attitude. It added to how I reacted. I mean, I think the only thing that was grounding is, I guess, the, the years that she was with me, she was quite, not stern, but she instilled a sense of responsibility within me. So I always had it at the back of my mind to try and do good in a way. Yeah. Um, so me being naughty or how this schools work, it was because I was, I'll talk back and maybe just not follow through the rules. To be fair, we did go out when we were not allowed to go out. Um, but they were strict, you know, those, like you said, those schools are family orientated. They're about rules. They're about, you know, guidelines. If you don't follow through, unfortunately you're out there. Um, so if you're coming from the hood and you know, everything, there's a set level of freedom and you want to do things yeah. your way. It's not, going to work so i learned the hard way to be honest with you um yeah but it yeah. got me here. so when you came to the uk and you know you, you're living with your mom after six years mm. and you know you already have this you know kind of independence thing going on how <laughs> was that <laughs> no nobody's ever asked me that question that was hard because i've yeah. not been around her as much and like you said, the independence got to me. I had an attitude. Um, it just, she just felt foreign for a while. Uh, we didn't understand each other. So, and then when I came to the UK, actually, they weren't working well. Like their relationship wasn't working as well. So we, me and her had to share a room. She had to leave. The assumption that I had back home is that they are doing well because she would send me money, she would send me things. And I'm thinking, okay, she's, she's living. Yeah. And I'm stuck here, so it's fine. So when I get there, it's going to be amazing and rosy. But no, I walked into like a struggle, basically. And it was a shock to my system because I'm sharing a room with my mom in the UK. And I'm 15. In my head, that's not what I came here for. <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> Even, you know, and I quickly realized that actually here people work crazy hours. Like, you know, the lifestyle is very different to what we imagine it to be. Then the mm -hmm. weather, it's cold. And then I also couldn't go to school because the schooling system starts in September. I think I came quite later, like November or so. So I had missed that school year. And then their schooling system is according to age as well. <clears throat> so yeah. they were considering where do they put me because I'm 15. So that's the last year or so of the school, school year. So there was all this and it was creating more chaos than good between my mom and her partner. Um, so I started to feel guilty and feel like, oh, you know, I'm the reason that's not working, but they managed to get me into school. And I think that was my saving grace. Getting away from home was kind of like going to school was a good thing for me when I came to the yeah. country, to the UK. Yeah. So we just, we just at odds all yeah. the time. So when did it break? When do you think that you began to really understand each other? Yeah. Um, I mean, I started going to school, so I started to have some sort of understanding of the system here. Uh, and I started to have more grace as to, you know, why she was frustrated. And eventually my mom and her partner, my, my stepdad <clears throat> got back together. So we moved to the countryside, which is very close to where I'm here right now, where I'm living right now. We live in a cottage though. I'm coming from the big city in the UK. I'm in Namibia. And then I go to a remote village in the cottage. To some people, it seems idyllic, but it wasn't for a 15 year old. Like there was one bus. I could not go and see my friends. I could not do anything unless I was getting a lift. So half the time I would just school home, school home. Um, but I also started to understand the pressures because, um, when I came, my stepdad, I think the, the, the issue was that his family didn't want a black family, even though he, they knew my mom because they were together for years, I think 15 years at that point. Um, and I think it was challenging for him to make that decision because he loved my mom. 
So he was then dealing with our pressure. And then there's a, her daughter, you know, he, she brings me over and we had to get our documentation. Um, so then there was that added pressure of paying for documents and getting, trying to get your visa. And I started seeing a level of like emotional abuse that I didn't, you know, understand. He was not like that when we were in Namibia. So I was seeing a different side to him. And I started feeling sorry for my mom. But at 15, you don't have the words and the resources to talk about things like that. So either I was either shutting down or just, you know, having an attitude or we would just argue. It took a while before we got to a place of understanding. And I'm not sure we're there yet, to be honest with you. But there are glimpses of appreciation because I guess we've gone through that together. And I think what helps is we, we, I just, I just do other things. I have my own life outside of that. So I think that's what I've done. Did your, did your parents, your mom and your stepdad, did they have kids? No, they don't. That is, that is hard. And I think a lot of people um, don't even think about that don't even talk about that you know because Mm -hmm. i think (laughs) and i hate to say it but anyway but you know a lot of young ladies on the continent are like oh i want to we we call white white men the muzungu yeah Yeah. yes it's muzungu (laughs) right oh you know i want to marry a muzungu all of this kind of stuff and all my problems will be gone right (laughs) (laughs) like he's my ticket my meal ticket to life Right, and then you know we see we see someone getting to a getting married to a muzungu. It's like, oh, ah, she made it. She arrived. She arrived. (laughs) (laughs) Not knowing that, you know, so layered. It comes with so many issues, and this is my first time talking about it. And I'm so grateful that you've given me the platform because. You know, it, 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 it took a toll on me for years. Um, and I've only been talking about it through therapy, which was recent. Uh, so you can imagine, yeah, it took years. And it's because that assumption is that. And it's hard then to call people back home and say, actually, we're actually, it, it's tough out here. And like, That's we're sharing great. a room. We're living off just his salary. He's actually struggling as well because the family is like, okay, be with her, but come, you can't marry her yet he brought her on a marriage visa. So then that started creating complications with the home office as well. And then just on a racial uh, aspect, we would go to restaurants. I mean, he was quite romantic and affectionate. And I give him that. I I respect and and value my my stepdad. So I knew him since since I was seven. Um, But obviously their relationship was also very chaotic. Um, So he was romantic and he would take her out. He would take us out when we go out, out somewhere because we're in quite rural villages. And in the UK, uh, the rural village side of things are the wealthier side of places. Um, so we'd go to this restaurant and people would just assume my mom is the wait, the, the, the cleaner or the waitress or mistake her for the toilet lady or something along the lines. So just those social small things that, Again, you feel like an outsider. Then you're going home, you know, for her, the partner is, you know, I don't know, back and forth with her and the emotional abuse, the she must do this and the verbal. And for me as a child to see that, I I couldn't say anything. It's like we should have, and my mom would be like, you need to be grateful that he's brought us over. You need to be grateful that at least, you know, our life is, is changed. It was changed. You know, she's a waitress, a single parent now who, in a way, she was blessed enough that he was, not wealthy, but it was good enough to sustain a lifestyle that we didn't have before. But for your peace, I don't know if it's worth it. And yeah, you're right. There's an assumption, especially back home, even when people see a white guy and a black woman, they just assume he's wealthy or something along the lines. And, you know, this that's a person who has his own problems, who has his own issues and there's the racial issues that come in it. Even if you have kids, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. Um, so yeah, I could, we couldn't talk about it. I don't even think we've ever told anybody back home about the realities. So I told my sister and even then she was like shocked because for them, the only really, you know, he would send money back home, but they didn't see the what's happening behind closed doors. Yeah. Yeah. The other side, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Do you think um, your mother ever considered going back? Or do you think? No, she was, she left her job for him. She left everything, left obviously me at that young age because he said, let's go and get married. Um, Cause they met in Namibia. Yeah. Uh, he was volunteering for 20 years in Namibia. Funny enough, he moved back. So my stepdad currently lives in Namibia and we are You're here in kidding. the UK. Yes. <laughs> He loves Namibia so much. That's the crazy thing. We call him Papa. He loves Namibia so much that he moved yeah. back years ago. So where my mom was like, where am I going back to? Like, I can't this country. I gave up everything. There's no way. It's like, you go, I'm staying. If we're breaking up, cool. You go over there. Because, I mean, I think for her, it was also maybe... Like you said, the, everybody thought, you know, you're doing well. You've gone with the right men. You know, da, da, da. To then go home and start a fret. Like, where do you start? Though, where do you she's start, been smart. girl? She's been smart. I mean, he, they, they, she bought a house already back home. Yeah. She has assets, but it's still challenging. So, yeah, she, he's back home and she's here. We swapped places. <laughs> <laughs> so, are they together? No. Ah, uh, okay. Look like five years ago, six. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Friends though, which is odd. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, fifteen years. It's you a know, long time. Th- it's a long time. It's a long time. I, yeah, the, I, ish, the, I lots of respect there. So you know, you, earlier you had mentioned that um, you know going to school when you went to the UK and going to school that was like your saving grace. Mm-hmm. Um, could that have something to do with why you um, are working as an educational programs manager? I think that's just come full circle. The title of that role is just interesting right? to me. I'm still trying to figure it out. I think God is just interesting. I think education in general, has been my saving grace because I'm the first graduate in my family. Both my mom and my dad never went to school. So both my biological dad and my mom never went to school at all. And I think I also didn't realize that I was academic until maybe I've only said it this year. (laughs) Um, But I was always doing good in school. I only went to school for a year in when I came year 15, like when I was 15. And then I had to go into sixth form to do my two years. And I guess I did well. I did politics. I did history. Then I ended up going to Kingston University. I did international relations sociology. And within that, I was just doing what I had to do. I didn't think it through. I just thought, okay, this is what I need to do. Um, but for some reason, because also of my mom's hardworking attitude, like she, when I came, she was working as a cleaner. Then she started working as a carer. So seeing somebody and you're sharing a room with and you can see that they're going out to teach. And then when she was back home, she was working as a waitress. One thing, she's always been hardworking. I guess that's always been instilled in me. So even while I was at college, I was working in a bar. Um, so I'd go to college, come back, sleep for an hour, go to like work at this bar that's not too far till one or 12 and then wake up tomorrow and go to college. Uh, and while I was at uni, I had I also worked at the club. Cause I had to just have money cause she, I couldn't, she couldn't afford to look after both of us. And I think having both that academic mindset and then that hardworking character pushed me in a way to always seek for opportunities and work. So, um, as soon as I got out of university, I started looking for jobs. I started working at Thames Water and I had friends who would also recommend certain things to me, uh, which was, I'm um, grateful for. Um, and then I decided, I mean, I wanted to do politics. I came home for 20, 2012 for my 21st birthday. And I said, and I, and I wanted to go into politics. Like my brother is in politics. My uncles are in politics, but I saw that the climate was quite ruthless. And I was a young black girl at the time. It wasn't cool enough. I mean, I think things have shifted now, uh, but it was challenging. And I was just like, and then I was also talking to some of the girls in the road about a lot of abortion and their reactions was like, ah, you just go back to your country, to that England. You just come with all these facts. We all want to hear it. Just buy beer. You know? <laughs> and I realized that actually I'll be fighting a losing battle because some people are not even open-minded to understand the impact of certain policies and what that means for their generation. And I was like, am I really, can I really fight this fight? Um, so I was depressed when I came back because that was my vision anyways 
And then I decided, okay, what do I want to do? I then volunteered for three months in Nepal and that changed my life. I realized that, you know, I wanted to use my empathetic skills, but also my can do character somewhere. And I ended up in the charity. I didn't even realize you could work in the charity sector. Um, and I've been in the charity sector for the past six years. And that's obviously where my stepdad started because he volunteered in Namibia. So I didn't realize you get paid to do this. And the organization I work for is a nonprofit. So I've been, yeah, in the sector for a while now. And uh, for me, it combines both that political, because you need to know about current affairs and try and either redeem them or support people within that. But it also gives me the ability to use just the emotive side of me that maybe politics wouldn't have allowed me. I don't know. Maybe that's a lie. But yeah, education has brought me here, basically. It's the studying, yeah, and pushing for to do the right thing and and to, to succeed, I guess. Yes, yes, we went there. Let's face it, there are a ton of African women on the continent trying to bag a white man as a meal ticket who will save you from all of your problems. (laughs) Then, let's say you are one of the lucky few who is able to to wila e mozungu, eh? Then he whisks you off to his country and bam, you're hit with immigrant problems. The food is rubbish. You don't understand the language or culture, his family and or or the community don't accept you. And oh, he's an actual human being who has faults, <laughs> but your pride cannot make you go back home or even tell anyone back home what's actually happening because you keep remembering when you told Whoopi that you were better than her and she was nothing. Because you got a white man. Hey, girl. (laughs) You have left everything, including tearing apart your family. But how can you go back and say I was wrong? I made a mistake. The shame. And at that point, you think everyone will laugh at you. As a former immigrant... I want to tell you, if you find yourself in such a situation, it's not worth it, babe. When you have to make a choice between your peace of mind versus a life of shame, I would go with peace of mind every single time. Forget what people will say because their opinion is irrelevant (laughs) You know, irrelevant, like irrelevant. Focus on what is best for you and pursue it. Everything and everyone else will fall into place when you make that decision. So let me remind you, this was part one of my conversation with Penelope. Check out part two in the next episode. Mm, 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 mm. This girl, this girl is strong, guys. Hey. Okay, so big announcement. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Africana Woman is now in the business of helping African women launch your podcast. I said it. I'll say it again. Africana Woman is now in the business of helping African women launch your podcast. We are very honored to currently be working on a phenomenal podcast called Concrete Pastures, which tells the stories of immigrants, not the ones that you see in movies or, you know, the lies our families abroad feed us because they are trying to protect us, you know. Nancy Mulemwasisi is the host and she interviews immigrants and tells her own story of leaving Zambia to New York, USA to find her concrete pastures. Of course, you should go check out the podcast wherever you find your podcasts. As Africana woman, our role has really been in helping her launch branding, production, podcast mentorship and social media management. It is such a great honor to be able to see another African sister bring to light such important stories. That could be you. 
If you want to start a podcast, reach out. Let's have a conversation, okay? My email is africanawoman at gmail.com or visit the website africanawoman.com. So you know how we do. Give people their roses right now, like right now. <laughs> Find Penelope on Instagram at penalope. It's kind of spelled like that. So just look for Penelope. Um, just go to our show notes. So you'll find it right there. Tell her you heard her on the Africana Woman podcast and say thank you. Because I am just so grateful of how uh, vulnerable she was in being able to share her story so openly and authentically. And I just want to say thank you again, Penelope. Y'all know my playground is Instagram. Find me at Chulu by Design. Tag me. Tell your friends about the Africana Woman podcast. Let me know what you took away from this episode. Talk to you soon, my darling. This has been a production of Africana Woman Media.